Recently, MSI gave us the opportunity to review an X399 Gaming Pro Carbon Motherboard, a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti Gaming Trio graphics card, and finally, a Threadripper 1950X processor. My name's Paul, and in this RedGamingTech.com video, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. As part of our Threadripper coverage, we decided to look at the platform in two distinctive ways. The first is a traditional review where we load up an application and let the application have its way with as many threads as it can handle, and then note down the performance. The second video, this one, is going to be a bit different, and aims to tackle how well the system handles multitasking. After all, it's pretty obvious that a 1080 Ti, 32GB of crucial RAM, and a high-end motherboard, and finally 32 threads, will be able to run games fairly well. But how well can it run those titles while the system is also being asked to accomplish other tasks? So let's talk a little bit about the hardware and setup before discussing methods and results. Do know that this is not a sponsored video, and although we were sent the hardware for review purposes, the graphics card, the motherboard, and processor have, unfortunately, been sent back to MSI, and all of opinions are our own. The first thing we did is obviously put the base system together. Once again, a Threadripper 1950X processor was the heart of the machine, and a GeForce GTX 1080 Ti MSI Gaming X Trio provided the visuals. There was also 32 gigabytes of memory, courtesy of Crucial Ballistics. This was running at 2800 megahertz. And we also plonked all of this on a Gaming Pro Carbon X399 motherboard. We then installed three different hard drives, one SSD and two fast mechanical drives. The OS and application XEs such as Adobe Premiere were running from the SSD. One hard disk was reserved for games, and the third and the final drive was either for footage to be exported to, or for the images of the virtual machines. More about this in a moment. Windows 10 64 was then installed and left to update to, of course, the latest versions. And then, finally, software and drivers were also installed to their latest versions, along with the newest BIOS revision for the motherboard. So, on to methodology then. The premise is simple enough. Can Threadripper pen out enough performance across its cores, along with sufficient amounts of memory bandwidth and cache, to power the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti while handling other tasks? Of course, we don't just want to be able to run the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti. We want to achieve one crucial thing, and that is playable frame rates. We decided that anyone with such a setup is likely not going to focus their attentions on low resolutions, for example, 1080p. So instead, we decided to focus our attention on what you would ideally wish to play the games at, like normal, on this setup. In other words, 1440p or 4K with the appropriately high levels of detail. Threadripper, for those who don't know, has dual modes of operation, game mode and content creation mode. Without getting into the specifics in this video of how each operate, we decided to run tests in creator mode. We didn't have the time to run tests across both creator and game modes, so we decided to pick the mode which you'd most likely be running the system in if you were busy creating content, and instead were gaming to pass the time while, say, something was exporting. The tests were conducted in two distinct scenarios. The first was Adobe Premiere, set to transcode a 4K video to 1080p. There weren't any special effects applied here, and we also disabled GPU acceleration. Of course, if you were just running Adobe Premiere, you'd certainly want to leave a GPU acceleration enabled, but given we're trying to test gaming performance while the export was in progress and CPU performance while encoding, leaving it off made of course the most sense. The second scenario was a little more complex and revolved around Virtual Machines and Prime 95. We downloaded and installed the latest trial of VMware Workstation and then fired up a VM with Windows 10 installed. I then cloned the VM image twice allowing us to see the results when we fire up three separate instances of the virtual machine, and then decided to screw around a bit with the processor allocation, deciding that 4GB of RAM per machine was a reasonable quantity. I then allocated 8 threads to two machines, meaning 16 threads total, and an additional 4 threads to the third machine, meaning 20 of 32 threads were gobbled up by virtual machines. Then it came down to testing, and it decided that Prime95 was a perfect example of something that would easily be tweakable in testing, would run on a constant torturous loop, and would represent just about the worst possible scenario for the processor, 
There was also a rather nice bonus to Prime at 95. It doesn't push the GPU at all. Thus, in tests, it was easily repeatable, and any performance issues can easily be attributed to the CPU being hammered, rather than data suddenly being paged to save the GPU. Also, because the hard disk wasn't being thrashed or brought into the picture, Windows 10 and Prime would load into an allocated chunk of RAM, meaning there was little hard disk activity on any of the free VMs. With that said, there are two tests Prime 95 offered which are particularly of interest here. The first is Blend, the default test. It tends to hammer the processor, cache, and system main RAM, DDR4, fairly evenly. The second test is Small, where the data sets, as the name implies, are smaller and aims to fit squarely into the level 2 cache of the CPU. It tends to be great at stressing the FPU, floating point unit of the CPU, but don't consider this test as easy. Try running this test across your processor threads, and then try doing much of, well, anything while it's running. If you allocate all of the threads to this test and try to do much of anything, even web browsing, you'll find it's not going to go so well. We ended up testing several different scenarios, with different mixtures of small and blend running across multiple different machines. What we found was pretty simple. Small could run rather comfortably across all of the virtual machines, all three, gobbling up all 20 threads. In fact, performance didn't really dive until we decided to up the number to a total of 24 threads, thus increasing the number of threads per virtual machine slightly. However, blend tests were a bit different, to say the least. One VM with blend wasn't too big of a deal, and indeed, Threadripper handled it fairly well. But running all three with Blend turned the frame rates of games, be they DX11 or 12, into a stuttering mess. The frame rate rapidly going up and down like a yo-yo as the memory system of the processor was hammered. I suspect very fast RAM, running more for 3200 MHz, might help some, but not likely enough to bring anywhere close to an optimum experience. Understand, disk crashing isn't the culprit. Instead, the entire processor's memory system was being assaulted. The CPU caches, particularly level 3 I suspect, was just filled up with data. For reference, the RAM was running at 2800 MHz in quad channel mode, and according to Ada64, the results were read of about 65.6, write at about 79.1, and copy of 68.7. The reason blend tests are so detrimental in performance is how Threadripper's CCXs are designed, and the shared level 3 cache system. Essentially, while level 2s are exclusive of level 3, thus data isn't mirrored between the two caches, leaving uh, more room for unique data across both cache levels, level 3 cache is shared across multiple processor cores, while level 2 is separate per physical core, meaning at worst they would need to service two threads thanks to SMT. To put it simply, when we have one VM, we'll call it VM A, is running and eight threads of Prime 95 on blend, the cache of the other cores can handle it. As VM B and C are running just as small tests, therefore the game is allowed to run without too much of a hiccup, because the level 3 caches of the other CCXs aren't filled up and it's ample level 2 cache to run the game's code. But when more VMs are shifted towards blend, particularly all three of them, Performance just takes a massive dive as the processor's various caches and memory systems just are hit like a semi-truck that is Prime 95. In short, Prime 95 is just doing what Prime 95 is designed to do. It is designed to saturate the memory system and, of course, processor threads. But what is evident, rather beautifully, might I add, is that during such testing, Threadripper is still capable of running games, despite the multitasking which is being asked of it. Gears of War 4, designed squarely around Microsoft Direct X12, happily runs rather well during video encoding or various VM tests, albeit unless there's a lot of blend tests on the virtual machine going on. Clearly, the blend tests represent the worst case possible scenario, and one that isn't really a realistic portrayal of what the average VM would entail, or even a typical 3D rendering workload would do to your system. Meanwhile, Doom, the poster child of the Vulcan appy, manages a similarly impressive showing. Rarely do you get the feeling that the CPU is holding back the action. Sure, your game might exhibit more micro-stuttering here or there, but generally speaking, particularly for a single-player experience, you'd rarely feel that it was impacting 
your gameplay enough to render it less enjoyable. Witcher 3 dips to as low as 30 frames a second with fluctuating frame rates while under heavy VM load. With the game's large number of NPCs, huge terrain and draw distances, physics and objects straining the processor. Indeed, Witcher 3 and Crisis 3 tend to heavily benefit from faster processors with 8 threads being rewarded, a reason that a Skylake or Cable Lake i5 would generally perform worse than an i7 from the same generation, which is contrary to a lot of games from the same era. Fortunately, or unfortunately, depending upon your perspective, rarely does video encoding of Adobe Premiere fully leverage the vast number of cores in a high-end desktop platform, and thus, typically, particularly in a 1950X Threadripper, quite often, not only do you have a large number of cores not being worked that heavily, it's rare that there are long periods of 100% CPU usage on a single hardware thread. Indeed, we typically saw CPU usage hover between the high 60s and low 80s. This means that there is more cache and bandwidth thrashing on a synthetic virtual machines that isn't present here. Of course, there are caveats, such as the heavily depending upon effects applied during video editing, and of course the speed of the disk you're using for source and export and the games you're playing. But we are fairly confident in all but the most extreme tests, perhaps large projects with Adobe After Effects also in to play and likely GPU acceleration as well, you'll be quite content being able to play games. Of course, this might ne negatively impact your encoding time, so maybe don't do this while uh, exporting for a certain deadline, huh? Well, what about memory usage? Well, memory usage, of course, depends upon the number of applications resident in RAM. With the VMs, we allocated only 4GB per VM, meaning that in theory, at max, we'll see 12GB being used. But because of Windows 10 and Prime 95 installs were bare-boned, and those were the only applications running, in reality a lot of RAM simply wasn't being used in that 4GB chunk. Games of course were greedier, and depending on the title, you would see spikes of between 1-2GB to two more or less depending upon the game. We noticed in game tests that Gears of War 4 was particularly hungry for RAM. Over 17 gigabytes was used with the free VMs ticking away. This was just the host OS, VMware Workstation, the free VMs, albeit they weren't, of course, using the full allocation of 4 gigabytes, Steam, MSI Afterburner, and finally, Gears of War 4. Things changed considerably with Adobe Premiere brought into the picture, with Batman Arkham Knight, Rise of the Tomb Raider, and of course our dear friend, Gears of War 4, hitting between 27 and 29 gigabytes of RAM usage. To be clear, this was with only Windows 10, the host OS, the game, Steam, MSI Afterburner, and Adobe Premiere loaded up. No virtual machines here. I do suspect if we had used a more typical creative workflow, such as also having Adobe Photoshop, possibly After Effects, or maybe even a 3D rendering application such as Blender open, RAM usage might have easily hit the full 32 gigabytes afforded to us by this particular crucial ballistics kit. Of course, in those instances, data would also be paged to the Windows swap file for applications which weren't as important, such as data being paged for Photoshop if it hadn't been used for some time, to make way for Adobe Premiere and, of course, the game's logic. We'll likely investigate memory usage a lot more soon, as we've also got data from an X299 build and we want to bring memory bandwidth performance up on Intel's platform. So, what's the takeaway here then? Well, it's pretty simple. Threadripper does indeed put out enough performance to handle multitasking while playing games unless the conditions are incredibly harsh from the memory system. In short, it's more likely you'll hit an I.O. issue from disks not providing sufficient data, memory bandwidth being eaten up from the DDR4 or plane just running out of main system RAM to begin with, or with some applications, your GPUs being used for acceleration and thus not leaving ample time for rendering of games, rather than running out of physical or logical cores slash threads. This is a great thing and helps to illustrate the point rather well. For users who do a lot of VM work or video encoding, Threadripper has more than enough performance to allow you to do gaming, albeit not at perfect conditions, while being able to run those tasks in the background. We'll likely put out a second video, likely with Ryzen 7, albeit with the test scale back a bit, to also test out to see how that handles things as well. Of course, for the average user who does just a little bit of video editing on the side or perhaps a little 
um, 3D modeling or perhaps virtual machine work, Threadripper is definitely overkill. But these tests are still very interesting, and it'll be very interesting as well to see how perhaps Coffee Lake, as well as once again Ryzen, handles very similar workloads. But we suspect that for the average user, who perhaps does a bit of video editing on the side and primarily games, Threadripper is probably overkill. For those who need it, it's a fantastic piece of kit, and we'll have a more traditional use of Threadripper's coming soon, going more into the actual performance applications on their lonesome, so do keep an eye out. As usual, thanks very much for watching the video, and feel free to check out our Patreon, where you could support us for just a single dollar a month. Finally, thanks to MSI for loaning us the GeForce GTX 1080 Ti Gaming X Trio graphics card, the X399 Pro Carbon Motherboard, and the 1950X uh, Threadripper processor. I'd also like to extend a thank you to Crucial for providing us the 32GB uh, Crucial Ballistics kit which we used in this video. And I can't forget you guys, so thanks very much for your support, your viewership, and if you would uh, perhaps consider subscribing to the channel, providing us a like, and definitely leave a comment to let us know what you think of this type of content, I'd be incredibly appreciative. With all of that said, I've been Paul, take care of yourselves, bye for now.